the 1870s, a momentous decade. Congress creates the United States Department of Justice, ratifies the 15th Amendment, guaranteeing voting power for African-American men, passes the Ku Klux Klan Act, authorizing the president to declare martial law to suppress the horrific organization. Montgomery Ward issues its first mail order catalog, and Levi Strauss patents the blue jeans. The first Kentucky Derby is run, and the winner, a black man, Oliver Lewis. June 27, 1872. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a prolific writer of poetry, novels, and plays, is born in Dayton, Ohio, to Joshua and Matilda Dunbar. Although the marital discord between Joshua and Matilda caused Paul to live a transient life, moving from neighborhood to neighborhood and attending many different schools, it did not stop the child prodigy who wrote his first poem at the age of six and performed his first recital at the age of eight. Matilda and Joshua were born into slavery and in their support of their son's love of words, they often told him tales of the plantation life they had endured. These stories found their way into many of Dunbar's poetry and prose. In a 1902 newspaper article, Dunbar wrote, My mother, who had no education except what she picked up herself, and who was generally conceded to be a very unusual woman, taught me to read when I was four years old. Both my father and mother were fond of books, and used to read to us as we sat around the fire at night. Paul and Matilda's relationship was a strong one. His mother ensured that he received a stellar education by attending night school herself to improve her own literacy skills so that she could help her son. And Paul rewarded her efforts by receiving a high school diploma, a feat only accomplished by less than 3% of Americans in 1891. At his graduation ceremony from Central High School in Dayton, the entire graduating class performed Farewell Song, written by Paul, with music by F.C. Mayer. Although Matilda wanted her son to be a minister, and he himself aspired to be an attorney, fate had a different path for him, though it was not an auspicious beginning. After graduation, Paul secured a position as an elevator operator. He was often seen perched on his stool in the elevator surrounded by books and papers. Throughout his tenure in this job, Dunbar gave several free recitals in and around Dayton. While Paul struggled to succeed in Dayton, often receiving negative reactions to his poems, a number of local citizens recognized his genius and offered him assistance and support. He was hired as a page in the Dayton Common Pleas Court, the first time a colored man had ever been appointed to a position in the courthouse other than as a janitor. It was in this position 
that Paul decided that instead of pursuing law, he would dedicate his life to writing in order to interpret my own people through song and story and to prove to the many that after all, we are more human than African. And so he continued to search for other employment representative of his education and literary accomplishments. He accepted a temporary position as editor of the Indianapolis World, and while there, happened upon a poem in the Boston Monthly Review, written by a poet, New Orleans native Alice Ruth Moore. He wrote Miss Moore to comment on her poem and the ideas she conveyed in it. Now Dunbar was no stranger to romance and love, as demonstrated by the swooning ladies at his performances. However, his love for Alice, who became his wife, is legendary. Dunbar returned to Dayton and began to write tirelessly. His works appeared in the leading journals and magazines of the day including Harper's Weekly, the Saturday Evening Post, and Current Literature. Commentators, including William Dean Howells, often noted that Dunbar appeared to be of pure African descent at a time when many leading members of the African American community were obviously of mixed race often with considerable European ancestry. This distinction, along with the admiration of his poetry and short stories, led to an invitation to do a literary tour in Europe. Prior to leaving, Paul asked Alice Moore to marry him. She accepted. In February 1897, Dunbar set sail upon the Umbria for Liverpool, England. He received a hearty welcome as evidenced by one of his letters to Alice Moore, now his fiancée. The people are very nice to me. It appears that I am the most interviewed man in London, the best papers having sent reporters to me. Later that year, the Library of Congress received a letter from lawyer, orator, and library patron Robert G. Ingersoll asking if the library had a position for Dunbar. An excerpt of the letter reads, Dunbar is now in England. He is coming home. He, of course, is poor, but he is crazy to read, to be in the company of books. Could you give this young fellow a place in the library? Dunbar secured a position as an attendant in the Library of Congress. He worked in the library's closed stacks, dealing with the dust and the must of books in a hot closed space it was unpleasant work for the young man and strained his health. Oh, but sometimes adversity inspires great art, and Dunbar's experiences working in a difficult library environment in which he felt like he was trapped in a cage are the basis for one of his best-known poems, Sympathy. Dunbar's most notable accomplishment during his time working in the library stacks had nothing to do with his actual job duties. He was the first poet to give a poetry reading at the Library of Congress. The reading took place in 1897 in the library's reading room. His other accomplishment while working at the library? His marriage to Alice Moore. She urged him to leave the job at the Library of Congress in order to focus on more important things. 
she encouraged him to pursue his writing. In addition, she encouraged him to promote his poetry through public readings. While in Washington, D.C., Dunbar also attended Howard University. Two short years after leaving the Library of Congress, Dunbar contracted a fatal disease, tuberculosis. Upon the advice of his doctors, the Dunbars, Paul, Alice, and his mother Matilda left Washington, D.C. They moved to Colorado, where Paul continued to write. Just as with his parents, Dunbar's marriage was rocky, and in 1902, he and Alice separated, but never divorced. They had no children. Despite suffering with a failed marriage and a fatal disease, Dunbar would continue to create prolifically. He wrote his final novel, The Sport of the Gods, a 300-page novel in 30 days. The film version with its integrated cast would later be released and marked a breakthrough in desegregation in the entertainment industry. Billboard advertised the opening on its primary page, making it the first time this level of recognition had ever been paid to a race film. The Sport of the Gods commemorative stamp was released in 2008. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was very active in the area of civil rights and the upliftment of African Americans. The great abolitionist Frederick Douglass called him the most promising young colored man in America. Dunbar wrote widely published essays critical of Jim Crow laws, lynching, and what was commonly called the Negro problem. He worked with other leading civil rights notables, including W.E.B. Du Bois, to create the American Negro Academy, the first organization in the United States to support African American academic scholarship in the liberal arts. On February 9th, 1906, Paul Lawrence Dunbar passed away in Dayton at the home he had purchased for his mother. The home has now been designated as a national treasure and museum. The newspapers of the time reported that the sweetest singer of his race is dead, having succumbed to consumption. It is said that he died in Matilda's arms while reciting the 23rd Psalm. He was only 33 years old. During his short 13-year career, Dunbar created more than 400 poems, a dozen books of poetry, four books of short stories, four novels, a play, and lyrics for a musical. His illustrious legacy leaves a national monument, university buildings, streets, parks, hospitals, libraries, and over 140 schools named in his honor. The Dunbar Apartments, as well as the Dunbar National Bank, were built by John D. Rockefeller Jr. to provide housing and banking for African Americans. Although the bank closed in 2008, the apartments have been converted to upscale condominiums currently in use. Many greats, including composer William Grant Still, poet and author Maya Angelou, author Toni Morrison, poet and activist Nikki Giovanni, poet and writer Langston Hughes, and author Zora Neale Hurston have been immensely inspired by his works. 
despite overt discrimination, despite financial instability, despite health issues, Paul Lawrence Dunbar kept plugging away. Dunbar was truly a brilliant black man who excelled in his brief life, leaving a wealth of literature that continues to be relevant to this day. In a 1905 essay, Dunbar wrote, people are taking it for granted that the Negro ought not work with his head and it is so easy for these people among whom we are living to believe this. It flatters and satisfies their self-complacency. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was born in Dayton, Ohio on June 27, 1872 and transitioned 33 years later on February 9, 1906. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, truly a man of distinction, a literary trailblazer.